Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on easier portfolio market trading. But before that, I'll give you a little bit of sneak peek into what can you expect out of this webinar. All right. So you see, the world has changed a lot in the last couple of years, especially the financial world. We have seen changes in the interest rates, and the inflation has gone up super high, and in, that too in the middle of this geopolitical crisis. And it's the same with our investments as well, because. If you see two, three years before, we have seen not so attractive, safer investments, but the equities were cheap and very attractive. And then came the pandemic. In 2020 and 2021, we have seen a massive rally of equities. And last year, 2022, it's, it's kind of a better year for Indian markets when compared to most of our peers. But 2023, my friends, it's going to be a little different and a bit challenging. To understand why is it a bit challenging, what are the changes that have happened, how can we strategize our portfolio better, also how can we absorb if there are any downside risks, we have our speaker today, Mr. Deepak Saha, who is a research analyst, and he is going to take us to the topic that I just spoke about, and he is going to help us strategize our portfolio as well. Over to you, Deepak. Thank you, Karthik. Thanks for setting up the context pretty well. That was spot on. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. So as you rightly said, Karthik, right, that the world has changed a lot in the last uh, few years. And uh, just taking forward from there, in a period of like this, uh, we have seen massive rally in equities in the last two years and 2020 and 2021. And when 2022 was kind of a under jittery for global equities, where India outperformed the rest of the other markets uh, in a relative basis. Now, how it is going to impact us, especially in 2023, when the things are looking a little bit filled with you know, headwinds rather than the tailwinds we had in 2021 and 2020. So just to give you some context, we'll start with how the markets did in 2022 globally as well as locally. Then we'll move forward what has changed in terms of uh, the fundamental dynamics and how it is you know, posing some of the threats to your equity and how should you build your strategies here on. Right. So to start with, now let's look at how global equities performed in 2022. So this is what we have done. We have taken all the major uh, global equity markets across developed and emerging worlds, and we have incorporated dollar adjusted returns. So it's better when you are looking at global equities, you should always look at in dollar adjusted manner. Now, when we look at these returns, one thing is definitely clear, clear that you know major economies like China, then other uh, emerging economies like Taiwan, Korea, they have definitely underperformed. With their dollar adjusted return, they posed nearly plus 20% return in negative territory, right? You heard it right, it's negative territory. And similarly, if you see US, that was down nearly 20% in 2022, because all the reasons that came up, be it slowing down of growth, then we are living in a high inflationary world, then rates going up, all of these things. And India, you can see that gave a return nearly minus 7% in dollar terms. So some of you might be thinking, okay, India gave in positive returns locally. But when you adjust those returns of all these markets in dollar terms, we are in negative territory. Yes, definitely we outperformed the rest of the global world, right? And that made us you know, resilient in 2022. But what it also did, it made Indian valuation or Indian market kind of, you know, uh, on compared to all the other markets, on a relative basis, we looked expensive now, okay? And the returns that we generated, it was further aggravated by the currency depreciation that we saw across the world. So the right side of the chart, if you just observe what it is showing, the returns, whatever we had, it was further aggravated because of the strength in dollar, right? That is what it looked like across the world in 2022. Now, on one hand, we have equities underperforming, the returns further aggravated by strength in dollar and depreciation in local currency. Now, one might think, okay, for local investors, it do not matter a lot. But when you think from foreign investors and institutional investors who are residing outside India, when they are investing in economies like emerging and India, what happens? This kind of things lead to a lot of foreign outflows. And that is what we have seen in 2022 as well. Right. So this is how things look from a global point of view. Now, coming to local parts, what we can see is how things turned out in a domestic manner. Yes, 
If you compare the returns of Indian market over 2021 and 2022, you'd see significant difference, right? Yes, obviously, Nifty 50 and Sensex, the benchmark indices, give stellar returns in 2021, aided by the supportive monetary policy, then businesses recovering out of the pandemic lockdowns. And we are also, you know, we lived in a kind of environment where demand was coming from a lot of pent-up uh, nature kind of demand and where um, the inflation was just started picking up. So that point of time, 2021, the problems were as not, you know, at that kind of severe level as it is right now. But 2022, we saw returns differing significantly. Like we barely managed to stay in positive territory, right? So that is what you can see, this blue part of the bar, that's 4.3% kind of return that we give in domestic currency. So what we saw is again in the previous chart, in global terms, when you adjusted the returns with dollars for foreign investors, they ended the year as far as the benchmarks are concerned in negative territory. For the local investors here, we barely managed to stay positive in terms of the market benchmarks. Right Now, if we dig deeper, a little bit deeper in terms of the sectoral rotation and the sectoral performance that market gave, right? So one thing that you would be able to observe, we'll spend a little bit time here because this is pretty important for us to understand where exactly the changes happened and why it happened. So if you see particular sector wise, one thing is pretty you know, visible here, the leaders of 2021, which was IT, then metals, they are no longer the leaders in 2022. So the leaders of 2021 have turned the laggards of 2022. Now, if you see IT, right, a sector like IT, which generated 58% return in 2021, ended in barely, you know, in bear market in, in 2022 with 27% negative return, this part of the chart. On the other side, you see the markets like, you know, Nifty Metal, the metal sectors, which gave nearly 70% return. The large, the, the biggest uh, return generating sector in 2021 is relatively, it has underperformed, underperformed a lot, nearly 19% return it has given. But again, one thing going sector by sector, you need to understand where the changes happened. See, from the beginning of 2022 or from the starting of 20, from the end of 2021, what started happening is early signs of, you know, prices going up and economies dealing with more, you know, input cost going on the highest side. This thing started coming, early signs started coming and still some of the sectors continue to do well. But definitely it was an early indication of probably rates are going to move on the higher side. And definitely when you are living in a, you know, uh, kind of macroeconomic support driven environment, which was 2020 and 2021, that helps us or the growth kind of sectors to do well. And that is the same thing that played out in 2021, be it metals and ITs, which are kind of very much growth oriented and new, uh, new services kind of emerged. Those sectors did pretty well. Now, what started happening from the beginning of 2022, we all know inflation was rampant. It did not only pinch our pockets, but when we look at the business profits and the numbers in terms of the margin of companies, like IT sector faced one of the, uh, you know, for the first time, probably in decades, they saw the kind of attrition which they never saw, right? And which led to high cost for their profitability as well. On the other hand, if you peak uh, FMCG companies or metal companies, commodity prices were pretty high. In 2022 and we saw with the you know narrative of recession increasing how commodities took a hit on their chin now whenever they took a hit on their chin what happens there's a significant correction on commodity stocks like metals and all but they bounced back in the second half of 2022 though this was the case for growth sectors like metals then it's but we had completely different scenario for banking today in 2022. I mean, the year that gone by 2022, we had a completely different scenario. What surprised everybody in 2022 was PSU banks, right? Like 67% stellar return it gave in 2022. But if you see same PSU stocks, right? There are a lot of things we need to understand whenever you're going out and buying PSU companies. First thing is the quality of balance sheet. The biggest problem PSU banks in India historically has faced is the quality of balance sheet. Now, no denial of the fact that in last many years, they have cleaned their balance sheet. And on the other hand, government policies has been favorable and also increased vigilance of RBI has helped uh, these companies to maintain their you know, capital adequacy ratios and different other parameters that you can gauge in terms of quality of balance sheet. But one thing, if you see since 2008, last 12 years, Nearly PSU banks did not do anything, right? It was kind of a choppy market going up, coming down, barely not giving any return. 
Suddenly in 2022, the stocks did terribly well. It generated nearly 67% of return. But what led to that return, right? Now, some narrative started coming in. PSU banks started looking very attractive from valuation point, and they gave those returns. But last 10 years, if you now compare the returns of PSU banks, even till date, right, vis-a-vis -vis last 10 years, they have given nearly 10, 12% return or 15 to 16% return in last nearly 12 to 14 years. And it's not any kind of a significant return, despite of the sharp rally that you have seen in last six months. Right. So this is what has happened in PSU banks. And now after this massive rally, they are again uh, in a scenario like this when things are slowing down. Banking always takes the first hit. But on the other hand, if you see private banks like Nifty Bank, if we take, they have been remained in last two, two years, wherever they have been. Right? There's not a massive rally or massive fall. So that's fine. On the other hand, if you look at FMCG stocks, like uh, if uh, what happened in 2022, we entered into some of the FMCG stocks back in March, which was really, which turned out to be really good for us, right? And uh, what happened, those gave really un, 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 unbelievable re return or faster than anticipated return. Why? Because some of the FMCG companies, the way they managed inflation, because they are rural exposed. You pick most of the FMCG companies, they are rural exposed. They will tell you beforehand how the rural economy is doing. And the latest quarterly results that we are sensing from FMCG companies, though some of the companies are outliers, despite of rampant inflation, they're able to expand their margins, right? I mean, we can't take names because of obvious regulatory issues. But despite of all the situations, there are some companies who are doing really well within FMCG and they have given very favorable return in last uh, six to nine months. But the point that is coming from FMCG companies, be it the top, each, you know, top uh, FMCG companies or diversified FMCG companies, one narrative remains common that rural economy is yet to recover. And most of the revenue increases that they are seeing are, are mainly or primarily price hike driven rather than volume driven. And profitability continues to be in the you know, under certain, uh, they're facing the profitability part of facing still certain headwinds because cost has gone up. Yes, they have reported on sequential basis. Things are looking bottoming out in terms of margin pressure. But again, those things continue to be there. So the latest quarter, what we have seen is all the sector we spoke, how the sectoral rotation is happening. Money has moved from IT to FMCG to pharma. Then again, how, you know, how, how metal is looking and what has happened with PSU. A lot of sectoral rotation is happening. It clearly shows the way people picked or selected stock in 2020 and 2021. That's no longer playing out, right? So you have to be more agile right now. The stocks that you're picking, you have to be more selective. Even if they're fundamentally strong stocks, what you need to care about a lot is the valuation that they're trading at. We'll come to that part each and you know every aspect of it, brick by brick. But the point that we need to understand, there's a sectoral rotation happening. So this is what happened in 2022. The sectors which did well in 2021, they are no longer the leaders in 2022 because of the reasons that we discussed. Now, why all these things are happening, that is one of the important points that we need to understand. So moving to the next part, all the things that we saw were, you know, markets. In terms of market, we saw, okay, you know, Indian market is getting impacted, though they are outperformers in terms of their relative performance. Global market was severely impacted compared to Indian market. But when we are talking domestic, the bigger impact was elsewhere. Where was it? Right. So the bigger impact was in IPO market. Like if you remember 2021, every other day we used to, you know, get to see on newspaper or mainstream media that every other company is getting the tag of unicorn, right, on every other day. But the thing completely reversed in 2022. If you just observe this particular chart, 2021, from markets, companies, private companies which got listed, they generated nearly or they raised nearly you know, 1 lakh 19,000 crore worth of money from primary market. This is the capital that they raised. It took a significant dip in 2022 and that amount nearly halved from 1 lakh 20 crore to 60,000 crore. And the number of companies which raised similar number of uh, you know, amount in 2022 also declined. So if you see 2021, nearly 63 companies did successful IPOs, where the number came down to nearly 40, right? Because of the environment. So these are one of the ways to look for you, how the thing is changing or how the ground is shifting beneath your feet because of the changing dynamics of investment vault, right? So 
there was a complete topsy turvy kind of a thing in ipo market and we know some of the new age ipo companies which raised i mean some of the new age companies which did raise their money from ipo market in 2021 how they have performed in 2022 many of the companies are trading 50 60% low compared to their issue price see i mean we are not saying these companies are good or bad that's not the point but the point is why this is happening the single factor is the markets are not that much conducive the money the kind of money all the businesses were you know able to raise in 2021 despite of the fact whether they are profitable or you know uh, loss making companies the thing has changed now still in the market you will find money the money that is there is no longer chasing loss making companies or unbelievably expensive companies the money is flowing to where the fundamentals are strong companies have sufficient profits and revenues and the valuations are not unreasonable this is the thing that is playing out in market so what we discussed is so far that is the outcome that we have discussed what happened in 2022 compared to 2021 both global level and local level and in terms of domestic market the biggest pivot has been in ipo market right and we have seen how ipos have turned completely topsy turvy in 2022 compared to 2021 now moving forward what has led to this paradigm shift see 2021 as we discussed 2020 and 2021 there is nearly no other alternative other than equity why first thing equities were unbelievably cheap secondly the other debt class you know debt asset classes that if you have referred or preferred over equity the returns were barely you know inflation adjusted or in developed nation the returns were nearly zero right if you just you know point or uh, put some of your reference here on the chart in 2021 if you consider the us right us had nearly you know bond yields at 1.2% for 10 years and 2 years bond yields were nearly 0% right is barely managing the 0% territory and within a period of next uh, like last 6 to 9 months in 2022 we have seen same bond yields are rising sharply right so in us from 1.29% it has moved up to 4.3% similar thing for india like fixed deposits home loans everything was very much easily available and rates were kind of very much attractive for loans whereas rates for fixed deposits and other debt kind of investments was pretty low and 5% in india so two things have happened in 2020 and 2021 when equity was there was no alternative right there was no alternative to equity because debt was completely ignorable because of an attractive return that was associated with it on the other hand equities valuations were pretty cheap so no wonder money flew to equity and that led the rally that we saw in equities throughout 2020 and 2022 now with the pivot in monetary policies across the world including india we have seen yields turning really attractive and which has made debt investments now really considerable over equity for the clients who are not okay to take with more risk right so the clients who have or the investors who have a very low to moderate risk definitely they are preferring debt as a point of choice you know over equity now this is one part which has made completely different you know environment for equity market investment in 2022 why first there is alternative now there are reasonable alternatives available with respect to equity for certain class of investors on the other side equities have become expensive now the valuations are not as you know attractive as it was in 2020 and 2021 the other part which has led to this significant paradigm shift is the commodity prices right so when we talk about inflation a lot of us talk about inflation it's being rampant pinching our profits uh, you know pinching our profits and businesses for corporates are you know witnessing lower profitability now when we talk about all these things what we are essentially talking about is the commodity prices right and if you look like for your ease of understanding what we have done is we have taken last last decades data and we have scaled it down over 100 and we wanted to see where the commodity prices are compared to their long term average right do commodity prices you can see throughout 2022 and 2021 it went up significantly it went up but they have corrected a bit right but still the commodity prices like aluminium copper crude oil natural gas they continue to be higher than their long term average and which which continues to pinch the profitability of corporates right that is what is happening in terms of when we are talking about what has led to that significant shift so one hand when we talk about equities 
there are alternatives and because of increase in yields we are seeing some you know equity premium increasing and valuations in the backdrop of commodity prices increasing which is leading to lower profitability for the companies lower cash flows for the companies which will detail in detail manner we'll discuss in the last slide but because of this the profitability or the margins of companies have come down now why it is important to correlate because at the end of the day share prices are nothing but present value of future cash flows even it might sound little bit technical but to simplify it for many of you at the end of the day a share price whether it will go up or come down it is dependent upon the bottom line and the cash flows that the company is generating the profits that the companies are generating and definitely because of high commodity prices i mean you pick any sectors right even even be it, i mean if even if we ignore the service sector within you know uh, industrials you go into manufacturing you pick some of the fmcg companies you pick uh, other capital goods companies all of them are facing the same thing lower profitability why some of the companies are facing destocking inventory issues because of so much volatility in inventory prices that has led to the erosion in profitability now in a scenario like this when valuations are expensive for equities we are having two things in the background one yields have gone up on the other hand commodity prices have us continuing to be on the higher side it it remains elevated right now how it is going to impact especially indian market when we talk indian market the real indian economy because india is the largest importer of some of the commodities right now when we think about the commodity prices it has impact both on export side as well as import side now many of you must you know might be thinking okay india is a domestic consumption driven economy but when you look at at the statistics till 20% of the gdp comes from export right so now moving to the next slide as you can see what we have tried to do is what has been the historic export growth for indian economy and what are the likely estimates for indian exports right so you can see obviously because of favorable base 2021 exports shooted up like anything because 2020 2020 was we saw massive changes in uh, export because of the pandemic and lower uh, the, the you know the supply side bottlenecks that were prevailing in port side then the freight challenges all these things led to lower exports in 2019 20 and 2020 2021 but 21 22 there's a sharp recovery in exports but because of global world slowing down right because of the global world slowing down and one of the largest exporter of india is us and certain part of export goes to definitely europe as well because of all these things slowing global economy and recessionary risk emerging indian export is also in the near term at least in the near to medium term it might see some slow down and the estimates that are coming from different economic institutions <clears throat> or other bodies what we can see is 2022 and 23 financial year we would see moderate growth in exports but on the other side 23 24 the, the the decline in export is going to be even more materialized in 23 24 because of this entire slow down in global economy and remember this 20% of our gdp is coming from exports now definitely people will think okay it is export oriented and some other economies but it doesn't have lot to do with the overall market no it does have because what happens though we are saying export but lot of jobs are related in the domestic market with export industry and just like export is declining you can see the way in, the, the the way you know domestic side import would be impacted okay some might some at attribution some some attribution might be associated with the fact that china is slowing down and china has just opened up so that is why the supply side bottlenecks might lead to some slow down in import but ultimately if the export is getting impacted there would be certain impact on our economy also given 20% of the gdp is related with exports that is why the estimates again i would re reiterate the estimates for import is also expected to slow down so this is this is the major aspect when we are talking about the import and exports of india they are expected to slow down in 2023 as well as the 2023 we are almost done that's only a quarter left but 24 if i 24 those are expected to slow down massively right the other part is when we are talking about export and import other crucial part for any domestic consumption is the ratio between savings and your credit growth so when we are talking about indian savings and credit growth one one thing is pretty apparent is if you look at this particular graph the dichotomy of the graph clearly dictates one thing the credit growth has been pretty solid in india but savings growth is kind of declining 
And when we look at, you know, when we looked at the latest quarterly results of banking sector, you pick any banking company, the credit growth has been steadier. But on the saving side, clearly deposit mobilization is drying up. And it might be because of higher inflation, some of the job losses we are seeing, but definitely it is leading to lower deposit mobilization. Now, if, if, if the deposit scenario continues to be like this, I mean, okay, one can argue with the rise in interest rates, fixed deposits have become I mean, attractive. On the other hand, current account and savings account rates would be relatively better, right? But these are the things which only make the product, you know, kind of attractive. At the end of the day, the Indian savers need to save more to deploy more on the deposit mobilization. But at this point of time, there's a clear indication that we are seeing the deposit is kind of slowing down. Now, if at this point of time, deposit slows down, there is a potential threat going ahead. In 2023, we might see some moderation on the credit growth side, right? And when we talk to like this quarter uh, with this quarterly results that came up, when we are talking to managements of Indian companies, one thing is pretty evident, though they are sounding quite confident in terms of the, their capex, the new project that they're going to invest, they're sounding confident, right? But definitely there is a sense of delaying those investments because of the entire sentiment that is prevailing across the world. And that itself shows the credit growth going ahead, okay? that might see some moderation if the deposit on the deposit side if, you know if headwinds continue to prevail whereas on the corporate side if we see i mean definitely on a reasonable basis whatever plan they had on a long term basis they might remain intact but 23 and 24 especially that period we might see some moderation on the capex execution and that might lead to some lower credit growth in 23 24 now in the background of all of these things we understood what has led to this paradigm shift and what is going to happen or what is more likely to happen on the real street, not the market, right? So just to give you a small summary, 21, 22 was all different together given we had decade low rates available with us, economies were you know, coming back and recovering. On the other side, equities were pretty cheap and the fundamental dynamics completely changed with yields going up significantly on the debt instruments and commodity prices remaining kind of elevated. Because of this, we have seen how interest rates have gone up and how economies now are expected to slow down, especially the global one, right? When we look at US, when you look at Europe, like for example, if you observe the commentary from Indian IT companies during this quarter, one thing is pretty evident. They're definitely saying Europe is looking a little bit worse compared to US. U.S. still date is looking fine, but it might become tricky going ahead, right? I mean, the latest GDP growth data that came out a few days ago from U.S. looked kind of fine. It is not indicating any sign of getting into recession right now. But definitely when we look at other high frequency indicators like retail sales data or other PMI data, all these high frequency indicators are indicating slowdown. Definitely they're indicating some slowdown. Now, in a scenario like this, the background is such we are facing on Indian economy point of view, the expectations associated with export and import is also might moderate. On the other on the other side, we have credit growth and savings account, which might face some headwinds in 23 and 24. So this is how things are playing out in 2023 and 2024. Now, this is the entire background from real market and economic point of view. Now let's go and pick some real data about top 50 companies. So when we say that valuations are expensive, but earnings are slowing down, what do we mean by it? So we did a small analysis, an important piece of data that we find. We did we wanted to find some reality check. What is happening with top, you know, top 50 companies that are listed in India? Now, we simply took out the banking or financial sector because that has definitely played out well in last few quarters because of the industry benefit that they have seen because of change in the regime. Why? Interest rates gone up. Whenever interest rate goes up, what happens on the lending side or on the asset side that things turn favorable, you know, on an immediate basis. But on the liability side, basically the deposit end, right? Things start reflecting after a lag. So just to adjust that, we have taken our banking or financial sector and we've tried to understand how three things are looking on a half year basis. One, revenue, another one, profit, and another one is cash flow. Now, these are all year on year growth that you can see at this point of time. These are on half yearly basis. So first half of FY23, 
when we looked at the revenue of all the 50, I mean, uh, you know, banking adjusted top 50 companies, we found they have delivered nearly 34% revenue growth. But the interesting fact was most of the companies which have delivered this kind of revenue growth, that revenue growth was driven by price hikes, not driven by volume driven revenue growth. So this is the first point because of inflation was so high and they were facing, you know, margin or profit issues. They had to take their prices on the higher side and they increased the prices in a calibrated manner and passed it on to the consumers. So most of the significant part of the increase in the revenue that we saw, it was attributed to increase in price hikes, not because of volume driven growth where we saw massive market expansion or new market creation. No. So that was there for some of the companies because good companies always able to do it. But when we slice and dice it on an overall level, that was not the case. Surprising data is when you look the net profits number, right? We found nearly 6% in terms of the profits. Profits declined 6% year on year basis in first half of FI23, despite of delivering 34% revenue growth. And more interesting part, when you consider the cash flows from operations, they declined as high as 30% nearly 30% in the first half of FI23. So this is the reality. When we consider the top 50 companies adjusting banking sector, what we get is revenues are growing up on account of price hikes, not volume driven revenue growth, but you know profitability is still declining given the high commodity or input pressure that these companies are experiencing. On the other side, cash flows are taking hit as high as 30% for all these companies. This is the current situation. In the background of this, if you look at the valuation of Indian companies, so this is the valuation of all the global markets, including the emerging, especially we are focused on emerging markets. What you can observe is on this line, the black line is you can consider uh, this is the kind of global average and all the global markets, excluding India, they are at this point of time from valuation point of view trading lower compared to their historical average. The orange one can use this. This orange part is the historical average. This green one is their current price in terms of the valuation where they're trading. India is the only market, right, which is trading at higher valuation, not only, you know, with respect to its peers, but it is trading higher compared to its own historical average. OK, the, the reasonable argument that would come, definitely India's growth is expected to grow higher than uh, its peers. That is why India is demanding that kind of growth. See, historically, India has always been an expensive market. There is no denial of that of, of, on that. But one thing you need to understand in a scenario like this, when we are looking into corporate earnings and there are early indications that earnings might be downgraded in 23 or 24, right? I mean, if I 24, especially what we are referring to, in a scenario like this, when you are seeing historical valuations at such rap at such elevated levels. Definitely, it opens the window for some downside risk. Definitely, one cannot deny it. Now, this is the concern as of now when we talk about let's go and invest in this market full fledgedly. But also, investors need to take cognizance of the fact that valuations are not as healthy as it was in 2020 or 2021. In the background of, of a reality check, when we are seeing companies are struggling with their profitability and cash flows. So, you need to be cautious, right? So this is the entire scenario when, where we wanted to give you some highlight how the global world has turned out in 2020 and 2021, how the things have changed and how the you know uh, ground beneath your feet has completely taken a pivot in terms of uh, have taken a pivot in terms of the paradigm shift that has taken place, be it yields going up, prop, you know inflation rising, profitability coming down, and cash flow slowing in the middle of geopolitical concerns that are there. In a scenario like all this, you know, things stacked up against or in favor of India, we'll you know find out in future the valuation is elevated for Indian market. So one needs to be very very selective when we are talking about where to put our money, right? So this is the overall scenario, and we think going ahead, 2022 was relatively better, though it was very volatile throughout the first half. Second half again turned, you know, uh, kind of in favor of India, driven by the PSU stocks movement and everything. But 2024 and especially FI24 or calendar year 2023, we think there is a significant downside risk that might play out. But where, you know, pockets are there where we're comfortable with. But investors need to be cautious. Okay. 
how should you strategize your portfolio at this point of time and overall basis how should you put your money right so that is the final point that we wanted to discuss but that is the global setup and local setup that we have now getting to the real questions how should you manage your portfolio see before knowing how should you manage your portfolio one should know what you should avoid doing at this point of time first you know there is a rising trend in market and lot of chatter people are talking that every dip is a buying opportunity right see we do not deny the fact that the time for india has come and the coming decade is going to be for indian market and indian economy but definitely at the same time you also have to take cognizance of the fact that indian market is trading at very expensive valuation in the background of a kind of a slowing down of in a global economy and earnings also getting downgraded so every dip that you are seeing in market might not be a buying opportunity you need to be very selective lot of retail investors even you know many uh, hni investors also we speak with that that sense is definitely there though they understand okay there is a point where you need to get cautious but in terms of your investment execution we see uh, people are adhering to buy in dip opportunity every time market is correcting for example 1% 2% they think this is an opportunity go and buy and market will only go up is probably for long term it will but what you need to find is the stock that you are putting okay and if 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 the company is ultimately not good fundamentally and the valuation is not that favorable it is almost like chasing a falling knife you might think okay every dip is a buy but the stock continues to fall and you end up losing so this is a very you know uh, we it's like all of us know it but when it comes to execution most of us avoid following it the next part is ipo investment see ipo investment was a very hot topic in 2021 and we saw how things turned out in 2022 and how it is playing out like i would refrain from taking any name but one of the company in indian market which uh, which is raising money right now we know what happened in last few days right now these are the things okay one might play okay there is a one off kind of a thing if i have to give you an example from a generic market point of view you saw in 2022 like one of the the largest psu company which came to ipo market they had to reduce down their exposure in indian market right as far as raising money from ipo is concerned because they were not getting that kind of valuation so they trimmed down the number of percentage of amount i mean the percentage of amount of money that they were supposed to raise they trimmed it down because the conditions were not as favorable 2020 2021 uh, ipo financing was easy valuations were attractive equity there was no other alternative like equity there is a tina factor right like uh, people popularly say there is no alternative to equity now right now this is not the situation you see ipo markets if anybody is coming they are not getting that unreasonable valuation definitely in that background you have good companies because good companies always manage to raise funds at reasonable valuation but you need to be very selective that mindset people have to get rid of any ipo company that comes i'll put my money i'll you know get my money back with a healthy return that is not playing out the same thing happened in 2022 many of the companies which came in 2021 especially new age companies till date they are trading below their issue price and even some of the private sector companies which raised their money not trading at at a healthy level right so this is the condition at ipo market you have to be selective ipo market is no longer as much buoyant as it was in the last couple of years the next point is when we take up you know when we talk about putting money we blatantly think about only from the outer surface that okay let's go and put money in this stock that stock but in a scenario like this what is even more important how you are putting your money across asset classes it's not important that you need to have all the asset you know all the asset classes but in a time like this for certain investors again i would like to reemphasize and reiterate on certain investors because equity might not be favorable for every investors because the goals are different some of the investors say i have only one years of investment horizon if you have one year or you know nearly six months of investment horizon or you are not willing to take a lot of risk you have to have certain asset allocation outside equity i mean equity at this point of time either way it is better the longer the time horizon you have the better it is but for every investor it is you know kind of important to take note of at this point of time asset allocation is pretty important i'll give you one example okay standard disclaimers applied there back in 2022 june and july we started you know recommending uh, one of the non uh, equity asset class which falls under safe haven asset classes 
and there we made good amount nearly 10 to 12% return over a period of 6 to 9 months right many of you have understood that we are referring to gold again let me put a standard disclaimer we are not referring gold for anybody to go and invest it depends on lot of things right and we made good amount of money in last 6 to 12 in, in last 6 to 7 months nearly 10 to 12% return we are able to capture from our gold uh, recommendations that we did now the idea is not to generate significant capital appreciation by investing in non equity asset class but if there is any significant downturn for not and it is not applicable for all the investors but for certain investors if there is any significant downside risk this kind of asset allocation in the first place helps you to diversify your portfolio at asset class allocation level second within equity i mean diversification sectoral diversification all of us knows it that is definitely a way out but it helps you or it gives you an opportunity whenever the downside plays out you have certain amount of money to put it in a staggered investment manner into equity because we are not putting everything we are not suggesting everybody to go everything with all equity at this point of time i mean definitely there are certain clients who want it certain investors who can take that risk for them it is okay but if you are dealing with a condition where you have limited for example one or two years kind of horizon it is better you do not put everything at one go in equity and nobody can time equity right nobody knows where market will go tomorrow or the day after even one year later probably in long term the only way for market is on the upside especially for us indian market now in a time like this it is suggested you put some amount of money in equity you do in staggered manner and most importantly what you need to do the the, the security is where you are putting your money what is the valuation there is the valuation unbelievably expensive despite of being a loss making company please stay away from those companies at this point of time right so valuation and fundamentals now many a times i'll give you some examples few days ago we had a meeting with with one of our hni clients and what the point that they were raising okay some of these are very fundamentally strong stocks that they want to invest but when they looked at the valuation in the background of this earnings being downgraded or earnings are slowing down they avoided those kind of investments and we are on the same alignment he at this point of time only looking at fundamentally strong stocks will not help you if anything goes wrong you also need to understand what is the price that you are paying to invest in any particular company and we are very selective you know in terms of the price that we pay to get into a stock and definitely risk management is something that you can always attain through this kind of asset allocation and different sectoral allocation that we all know right but within that also there are different multiple layers now one last point is see irrespective of how many times we speak about all these things there is a fomo some days market go up like next week we have a budget okay the sentiment might be positive and there might be a bounce back then again people will forget everything you might avoid the downside risk that might play out and you can put all your you know money there there also what you need to do you need not join all the party and be get rid of this you know fomo factor because if you are continuously dealing with this fomo okay just because one day i miss the rally i'll end up lose you know um, i'll end up making money i mean i'll end up losing some returns right so this kind of things you have to avoid and in terms of fomo and all uh you need to pick fundamentally strong companies which have comfortable valuations i know this is everybody wants to some something they want they are looking for which is very difficult to find but definitely there are certain pockets across some cyclical and non cyclical asset classes uh, sectors where you can find this kind of investment opportunities now last thing but not the least when we talk about investments all of us are talking about you know in terms of the fresh investments that we are doing but where you have already put your money one needs to understand what is the position there you need to at this point of time all the investors we suggest plus review your existing portfolio this fresh money is fine that is what you are you know starting right now but where you already have your portfolio it is very important for you to take a periodic you know assessment what your portfolio is doing the stocks that you are investing probably fundamentally good and you have earned good amount of return but not booking some of the profits might lead to significant profit erosion given the valuations that where these companies are trading at the in the background of this you know economic headwinds or recessionary risk that are emerging see india might not go through a recession but it is completely unreasonable to say that we have become decoupled or you know we are immune from the global impact as we spoke 20% of the export is coming uh, you know 20% of the gdp is coming from the exports right 
So these are the few factors and few you know few points that you need to take care of when you are making your pro you know portfolio. One, do not buy in dip. Every dip is not a buying opportunity. Invest in a disciplined manner. Avoid risky IPO investments, which are like loss-making companies. No growth is there, and expensive. You know the valuations are kind of expensive. Then you need to have certain asset class allocation kind of portfolio. Right? Do not put everything at one basket. Even with an equity, like a lot of people are like, no, I am okay with equity. That's fine. If you have the risk capital, you can go 100% equity. But again, having some cash with you helps you to you know capitalize some of the opportunities. And the last part is FOMO. You need to get rid of the FOMO part, and you need to invest in a, I mean, on, on fundamentally strong companies with comfortable valuations. Right? That is that is the main part that uh, psychologically you know impacts investors a lot. Because we are always dealing with FOMO, so, so this is the overall strategy that we are suggesting to, and we are you know uh, giving kind of cautious view to everyone, and you should also follow this. And before I wrap up and you know get it uh, pass it over to Kartik, one standard disclaimers: we spoke about many asset classes, many stocks, I mean many sectors as well. Please do not misconstrue any of the statements or remarks that we gave as a you know speculative investment opportunity. Okay. Please consult your respective financial advisors, then only invest. So this is from my end, Karthik. Uh, you can go ahead and take the Q&A session uh, forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deepak. That was indeed very informative session. I have a couple of points I made a note of, and I'll be definitely working on those. Sure. So before I take it forward to question and answers, yes, the sir. first Please. question is from uh, Mr. Prudvi. Okay. And the question is, is invoice discounting and asset leasing good option? And the follow-up question to that is, if so, how should I consider them in my portfolio? Okay, so see, I mean, these days we understand uh, many people are talking about, you know, uh, whatever uh, asset allocation you have, you lease it and take a loan, right? So, and, and uh, you generate your asset and then you invest. So there are multiple opportunities and multiple investment mechanisms like that. Okay, many companies and many businesses do that, but you need to understand at what level, because if you're putting your asset there, you are not going to get the 100% uh, return on, you know, whatever loan you require, for example, there would be a haircut, right? So in terms, if you want to lease or pledge any of your investments, you understand what is the haircut that you're taking, right? Because equities definitely will never get uh, full-fledged value there. So that is the one part very subjective and that varies case to case. So, and, and other part, though it is not directly linked with that question, but one thing that we need to understand is a lot of people think about, you know, taking some lease and invest into the market. See, that strategy might play out for certain investors who actually have it well calculated, but always putting down your, uh, you know, investments by financing from other asset classes or some debt driven asset classes is not that much favorable. Everybody doesn't have that risk appetite to take. If you're only okay to take some leverages and put it that money, because you know how to play it, that might play out for you. But it's not like generally acceptable for everybody because they do not understand. In that case, you know, one has to be regularly monitoring what is happening with their investment. And the return or the, you know, the cost that you are bearing for uh, raising that money becomes really expensive. At this point of time, the cost that you were probably bearing a year ago to put in some of the investment mechanism is uh, kind of expensive compared to uh, like in over last two years. So it's better that it case to case basis you take a specific call. It's not meant for everyone though. Definitely it's not meant for everyone. Only professionals, Perfect. better that you professional you take a professional advice from your financial advisor, then you take a call. Perfect. Thank you. So I'll move on quickly to the next question. Uh, and this question is from Dr. Suman. And the question is, can you please explain simply about the Adani, Adani stock fall and what should we do at this moment? Be it any company. Uh, okay, I'll just give a standard disclaimer. Adani has never been part of our portfolio. Uh, we stayed out of it. So we had our in-house uh, different fundamental models, which we understand that uh, the return potentials are not that probably when we were looking in, in the possibilities of considering Adani. But, you know, any company that you're considering to invest there are multiple layers of things you need to understand, right? So Adani, it might be because of the research report that came out. Uh, it, it, you know, uh, recorded a significant kind of uh, decline in a single day. If I'm not wrong, all the Adani stocks declined 20%. But one thing that will come 
uh, be it Adani or any other stock, in a single day, whenever a stock falls significantly, the next thing that comes to our mind, let's go and buy it on the next day, right? And thinking that there would be a sharp bounce back. It might happen for any stock, even for this stock. But we don't know. We are not giving any recommendation there. But if you're chasing, more often than not, what happens, if you're not analyzing and do, doing your due diligence, okay, the stock that I'm investing, at the end of the day, what is the profit or what is the cash flows that these companies are making? And what is the valuation these companies are demanding? In a scenario like this, if you're chasing a company which is completely loss-making, profits are barely growing, I mean, uh, revenue is barely growing, and the valuation is super rich. So it's like you're chasing a falling knife where you'll bleed yourself. So it's better that you know you, you avoid those kind of companies. It does not mean I'm talking in direct reference to Adani. I'm giving you an example. Now, Adani, it's better you reach out to your you know, respective financial advisor, investment advisor, what you need to do there. But as far as Savat is concerned, with standard disclaimer applied, we, it has never been part of our portfolio. Fantastic. So I have one more question from Dr. Simon itself. I started yeah. investing in August 2022 when the compounding of stocks will start. When the compounding will stop. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Does that mean after one year of investment or one year end? Okay. See, uh, compounding, simple average, anything you say, these are technical terms, but compounding means every year, whatever money you are generating. For example, you invested in 2021, 100 rupees you invested. By the end of 2021, that become 110 or at the beginning of 2022, whatever it is, right? Next year, again, you are putting back that some money, you know, within your investment, you booked your profit. And over a period of time, every year, you're putting that money and that money itself is growing. That is what you essentially call compounding. Every year, the money that you are generating, you're putting back something and that is generating some return. That is the typical technical definition, right? That, okay, 100 rupees, you made profit, 10 rupees, 100 rupees, you invested, 10 rupees, you made, you reinvested. And next year, you got 100 and uh, out the 10% return becomes 11 rather than 10. So this is how compounding works. But one thing, uh, be it compounding or simple average, the way you want to calculate, you can calculate absolute or compounding. See, compounding plays out with two different factors, which helps you in generating money. One, the rate that you are able to grow your money, basically the return. Another is the time that you are giving to an investment. Like you are staying invested one year. It doesn't matter whether it is com you know, compounding or simple. Because anything less than one year, ultimately it would be absolute return. Now, over a period of 10 years, you have stayed invested. Every year, you are reinvesting something, right? Then compounding plays out and shows its real value when you have given time and also the return has been on the highest side. So there's a mix of both the ones, both the return and the time. So be it one year, I mean, compounding doesn't show its true impact with one year, definitely. Until unless you're thinking from monthly point of view and every month you're putting and it is growing exponentially, which doesn't happen on an usual basis. But compounding, you need two factors. One, you give time to your investments. On the other side, the return that you're able to generate, you just look out what kind of return expectations you have. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. And the next question is, in the current global market scenario, would one rather stay invested in Indian markets or move some of the investments to international markets? Now, if we break this question two ways, in his short term, another is long term. If you're long term, the kind of growth expectations that is there from India, some of the businesses which will continue to stay relevant in the background of a scenario when Indian economy is crossing over US in 2047. And this is the data not coming out of Savart. These are well researched data coming out of World Bank. If you compare India in terms of PPP, purchasing power parity, India is expected to cross US by 2047. And in terms of real economic terms, real economic GDP value, by 2027, it was expected to you know, reach nearly five to six trillion dollar. But because of this global slowdown and export is also getting impacted, we might see some, you know, uh, it, the, the, the timeline is getting pushed a little bit. It might not be five years, it can go, get seven years. So from investment point of view, we think we are at the right time, at the right place, with the right investment opportunities, that is India, right? Now in the medium to short term, if I have to paint the picture for you, as I said, 2022 global markets were heavily beaten down, okay? 2022 global markets like US, China, Europe, and other emerging markets, 20, 30% down. On the other side, India was up, right? Nearly 4%, in domestic terms I'm talking, not dollar adjusted. Now, in a scenario like this, for 2023, India is at this point of time from near term. India looks a little bit expensive compared to all those economies. So for a tactical call, one might think, okay, I'll do one thing for six months, 
I will put my money there in USA or other economies where the markets are heavily beaten down. But understand the recessionary risks are more aligned with US. Okay, short term we might underperform, but what risk you are taking there? So from a tactical allocation, definitely you can take a call between US and India for short term. But from a strategic allocation point of view, our suggestion is you stay invested and you pick companies in India, you know, and stay invested in a tight manner for the coming decade. Because if you can only make sure one thing, the companies that you are picking do not get obsolete in the coming 10 years. They, re they remain relevant because whenever this kind of economic revolution happen or economies grow from certain trillion dollar to next trillion dollar, we see a lot of companies become irrelevant and obsolete because of the technology or because of the segment or sector they're operating in. So those are the few factors you need to you know, take care of and you can stay invested in India for the longer time because definitely we are bullish on India. Fantastic. Uh, this question is uh, you know, very unique and it's directly towards uh, our company, Sawat. Is Sawat taking care of our portfolios being its customer? See, I mean, when you say your customer, it uh, it is self-explanatory that you're having a subscription, right? So now when you say there are two, let's take both the examples, irrespective of whether you're having a subscription or not, right? But at some point of time, you are Sawat's customers and it has renewed, uh, it has expired. If you're a customer, we do regular basis, you know, there is a system which takes care of the regular monitoring part, like all the stocks being suggested, all the different asset classes being suggested. What is the part there, right? how it is performing and if you have been with Safford for more than a year even you have uh, you know re uh, received a lot of notifications through your mail and app where you need to book your profits where in where you need to come out of uh, the sum of investments we did one rebalancing back in march 2022 another rebalancing that we did in uh, october 2022 where both the cases we booked profit and we came out of some of the investments right so definitely on a regular basis we take care and we monitor where the portfolio is and which stocks have been suggested to you. And also, if you are not a customer, it does not mean that we are not tracking your portfolio, right? It's just that we, you get a notification that that is a situation. But again, uh, you need to get your subscription done to execute the orders or keep on receiving the advices and rebalancing advices, right? So as far as rebalancing is concerned, for which we need to track the portfolio on a regular basis, we do it. If you have done any portfolio review from Savart, which have not been recommended by Savart, but have been suggested to you that you can continue to hold it, those are the securities also we continue to track. And if any rebalancing is required, we'll get back to you whenever you need to rebalance. And we'll not only tell you which, I mean, from where you come out, but after coming out and selling the proceeds, where you need to redeploy. So on a regular basis, on a periodic basis, you would keep on receiving those, you know, notifications or, you know, communications through mail. Meanwhile, if you have any doubt, you can definitely reach out to us to, you know, delight at their sabat.com or you can call our client delight team. They would definitely help you out. Thank you for that, Deepak. This question is again regarding Sawat as a company. Quickly, can you explain how is Sawat different from small case? Okay. See, uh, one thing is uh, we are not suggesting any particular model portfolio. Okay, go and invest in this portfolio and uh, we'll not do anything there. Okay, so the portfolios that we are doing, we are doing as personalized and customized portfolio as much as it is possible. But definitely, you know, I'll give you some examples. Uh, you go there, you check some of the portfolios that are already created, you go and invest there. Okay, this is what they're doing. Now here, depending upon the scenario and where we have our strong long-term bets, very uh, we are confident about, we give you those customized portfolio. Those are not static in nature in the first place. Secondly, for example, some of the clients are actually not uh, suitable with some of the penny stocks or small stocks or small cap or mid cap, right? Then they come and tell us, okay, I have this specific goal. I have, uh, you know, my children's education to finance or I have a goal which will for which I need to redeem my money within the next six months. Then equity is not an option there, okay? And a lot of things you need to take care of when there's a goal-specific advice that you need. On those cases, you do not have any of these options sitting with other competitors. I mean, some of the competitors might have it, but the level of customization that we are doing, right? We are not giving you, giving you a static portfolio, right? It's not a model portfolio kind of thing, but yes, time and again, we rebalance it. We do not only tell you, okay, you keep on investing there. We also tell you when you need to come out of those investments. Secondly, one of our key features, like at this point of time, probably you are holding 10 stocks, right? And all you are worried about where you go and put your fresh money. 
but you need to understand the stocks that you are holding what you do with them do you need to continue to hold them or you need to come out of them that is a portfolio review we do a initial screening for your portfolio we suggest you where you need to hold your stocks or why you need to come whether you need to partially come out of it or you need to sell you know at one go after selling where you redeploy those monies these are the additional services that we do when we are talking about you know uh, how we are different from other companies now i am not going into how our research works that's our, that all these things are well available on our platform how we are enabling tech and different other models to expand our research quality all these things are publicly available you can go and check but this is the primary area we focus as an additional services that we put it's not a static portfolio we do customize depending upon the requirement and goal secondly if you have any particular portfolio we also help you in assessing what exactly is going wrong or what how you should go ahead with it it's not required every time you stay sit with 50 60 stocks probably it's time to book some of the profits right probably it's time to come out of some of the stocks this kind of portfolio screening or portfolio review also is something that we do fantastic to so the final question i would like to take this generalized question that we have received kindly sure. advise best practices of wealth protection and wealth management see when you are talking about your uh, protection how do you protect your you know investments i'm not going into the wealth part because when we are going into wealth part i have to deviate from your uh, you know equity to or debt assets to different other investments but specifically i am keeping it to equity now protection or risk management is most relevant right now if risk management was not a concern 2 years ago given valuations stocks interest rates at very favorable level inflation not even a concern no geopolitical concerns having none of these concerns with us risk management probably nobody cared about in 2020 2021 though we had our internal risk management mechanism but at this point of time risk management is pretty important now there are two ways two to three ways you can do one as i said depending upon your objective you need to first take a call how do you diversify across asset classes right if you have certain long term objectives you need not put everything in equity at this point of time okay you can keep on investing in a disciplined manner where the where you have comfort and you can keep some amount of money in some of the non equity asset classes where the downside risk is really minimized and accordingly whenever the opportunity comes in a periodic basis or disciplined manner you can keep on redeploying those funds from non equity to equity this is the first part right this is asset plus allocation now another thing that we do within equity just to keep the downside risk protected we end up you know making a portfolio of 50 or 60 stocks which is like diversifying like anything ultimately we'll end up making very bare minimum return that is a first mistake that people do you need to diversify but it does not mean you need to overexpose and over diversify your portfolio in a scenario like this what we suggest is over a period of time after a certain point you should not diversify okay that diversification is one possible through sectoral diversification within sectors you can diversify within couple of stocks but you know 10 12 15 stocks if you are having over a long period of time is a well one to protect your downside risk but again it varies depending upon the goal that you have now for example karthik is there who is a very aggressive just to giving a hypothetical example if he has very you know aggressive portfolio he would never prefer to have a portfolio with 20 25 stocks right but if somebody wants to you know end up with 10 12% return is fine but they do not want to take way more risk right and if they have long term i think having you know 15 16 stock is not a bad bad idea but what we do in sabot typically we have never gone i mean typically what we suggest for our clients keep your portfolio concentrated now that concentrated portfolio helps in, helps is helps in your two ways one is how efficient is it so there is a concept called efficient portfolio you can create efficient portfolios diversifying it to the best extent possible where you are able to capture some return with an adequate risk so there you are not you know diversifying it like exorbitantly 10 12 stocks is sufficient for certain kind of investors right but diversifying it 50 60 i mean ultimately you end up losing money like i'll tell you what people do is they are having like uh, one of the clients i spoke with recently that gentleman had nearly 60 mutual funds not 60 stocks 60 mutual fund right and uh, you know where they end up uh, kind of uh, landing if 60 mutual fund each mutual fund have nearly 50 stocks you are investing nearly 3000 stocks right 
So this kind of diversification ultimately dilutes your return potentials. So it's better you make your portfolio in an efficient way, diversified in 10 to 12 stocks. But again, uh, you have to take care of the fact, what is your goal? What is your objective? Do not generalize it, guys. I would like to put a standard disclaimer there. If your objective is one year or two year, diversification has to be different through different asset class, right? If you're a long term investors, you can prefer equity. There you can follow concentrated investment in an efficient manner, right? So depending upon your scenario, you can choose the asset allocation. But at this point of time, assuming you're investing in equity only, right? Diversification across asset classes is important. And if you have the risk appetite, you can stay invested in equity. But fresh deployment of money in equity has to be in disciplined manner. Don't go all guns blazing right now. Because the downside risk at this point of time is way more relevant than it was last two years ago. Okay, so this is the way you can diversify and manage your uh, downside risk in terms of uh, the protection strategy that you should have. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Deepak. So once again, thank you everyone for joining this call. It was one wonderful session. And my key takeaway would be it's not just about investing our fresh money. It's also about reviewing our existing portfolio. That's my key takeaway. I'm sure everyone has some or the other key takeaway from this valuable session. And we'll wind the session here. You can download our application or you can just visit www.savart.com, S-A-V-R-T.com. And you can register yourself for free. Our people will reach out to you. Our executives will reach out to you and take the process forward. Thank you very much.